Well, hello, and um, hello, Mr. Elrod. Yes? Yes, yes. My name is David, and um, I'm, this show is called High Society, and we're doing uh, programs on the drug war and broadcasting them out on the internet. Thank you very much for appearing on our show. Okay, you may call me Mac. Thank you, Mac. Um, I, I hear that you were quite a uh, refugee activist during the Vietnam War. I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about that. I, I, I don't know too much about it except that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau at one point welcomed the draft uh, Dodgers into Canada, basically. And maybe you could give us a little background. Were you protesting the Vietnam War before you started uh, helping refugees? Or how did you get involved in that? Okay, I came to Canada in 1967. Yeah. Too old and too flat-footed to be in danger of the draft. Yeah. But because I did not wish to pay income tax to drop napalm on children in Vietnam. Right, I understand the that. The only way to not pay income tax in the United States is to either leave the United States or be a pauper. And as the father of six children, being a pauper was not really an option. You had to leave. Yes. Um, soon we uh, started encountering young Americans coming up, and so we became a, norm uh, a northern terminus of the Underground w Railway run by Unitarian churches. Oh, that's great. Uh, people from churches in uh, Washington State would drive up and drop people off at our house I'd come home every evening from work to find, in, you know, say up to a dozen young men uh, to put into sleeping bags on our living room floor, and then would start calling uh, members of Unitarian Quaker and Mennonite churches to find homes in which to house them. We tried to match uh, draft dodger with home in terms of job opportunities, because at that time you needed an offer of a job in order to immigrate. Right. Once that match was made, uh, we would uh, get a sweet old lady, white-haired lady in an expensive-looking car to drive the kid down to the border with $500 in his pocket and dressed to look like a bank teller. <laughs> uh, they would drive around the Peace Arch, uh, which meant then not going into the United States past, you know, the checkpoint, but right. into, pa outside the Canadian border. The drive no around the Peace Arch, back into the Canadian border, and land at the border. Uh, everybody knew what we were doing. Uh, the border people, you know, wink, wink. And, uh, oh, excellent! You had support. And and, and uh, at that time, you know, we had uh, uh, we had um, uh, a growing economy. Jobs weren't hard to find, and these people made a magnificent contribution to Canada. If you if I if I check around with them, I'm now the honorary grandparent of quite a few uh, draft dodger kids. In fact, I've done weddings for the children of draft dodgers. I mean, they're that old now. Uh, you find them uh, artistic directors of of, of uh, drama groups, dance groups, uh, directors of museums, nurses, well, social workers. Uh, that's Generally a, speaking, low-paying, high social service jobs. They made a huge contribution. That, that's a, a wonderful story, and it had many happy endings. I, I wasn't really old enough to experience any of that. I was born in 71. But, uh, <laughs> I was born in 1932. Right. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm wondering, was it really a universal, like everybody in Canada opposed the Vietnam War and everybody in Canada supported draft dodgers and draft Oh, possessors? absolutely not. But it was a strong, vocal, and active minority who did. Oh, excellent. The, the historic peace churches like Mennonites and Quakers, uh, the Unitarians uh, who are selective in their opposition or support of war, yeah. were the strongest. Catholics and United Church people were willing to do a lot of talking, but weren't willing to do all that much. Right. I mean, yeah. you take a six-foot black with a scar on his cheek who just deserted into your home. Yeah. It's not something everyone's willing to do. It's it's sometimes a bit of a cultural bridge to yes to to get in there. Now, did you ever have any uh, problems with the authorities, either American or Canadian authority? <laughs> well, <laughs> we once had a. Uh, this guy show up in government shoes with a pencil that had U.S. government on the side of it pretending to be a draft dodge, although he was far too old. So we sent him off to, to a uh, free love commune on the island. <laughs> it would be a good experience for him. Yeah, well... No, we never had any official uh, problems. Well, that's, that's good. I think you were probably, you know, following the golden rule, and that mm -hmm. protected you somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, now, 
we here in the, uh, the Drug Peace Activist Group, which your son is a very active member in, uh, we're trying to organize an underground railroad for people who are either doomed because they use marijuana medically and are, and are in a state that has uh, been very repressive in that respect, or else doomed in that they're facing 20 and 30 year uh, long sentences that they can't handle for uh, simply growing or dealing cannabis. And uh, we put up a website and I was wondering if you could get some of, of your old contacts interested maybe uh, to ask them to look at the website and see if there's any interest now for a modern day get the railroad back going up. There's a little more uh, obstacles in that. There's not I guess as, as much consensus on the immorality of the drug war amongst all groups, especially all religious groups, but still there is a need for it and um, I was wondering if you knew of anyone who'd be interested in helping us out. I am more than supportive of what you're doing. Uh, I don't think that, uh, <laughs> you know, an awful lot of the people who helped then are now dead yeah. in the first place. In the second place, you're absolutely right. There is less understanding and less sympathy with and less awareness of uh, United States persecution of uh, people who need medical marijuana. Yeah. I have personally dealt with two medical marijuana refugees, uh, but I am not finding a general consensus and support network well, for this, as well as, of course, there's been a complete turnaround in what happens at, uh, in terms of immigration. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, you know, as you know, there is now a hearing going on in Vancouver for one medical marijuana refugee, and there's a member of parliament uh, uh, fighting it tooth and nail. Yes, yes, Randy so, White so, and Steve uh, Covey. You know, in terms of my being a resource, probably not, uh, except, you know, good wishes. In terms of advice, yes. uh, I would say inundate... Uh, uh, members of Parliament with with concern on this subject. Uh, certainly, that's what I'm doing, and I have had two so far agree with me. Yeah. Uh, in terms of seeking a support network, I think I would go through the the uh, drug law reform activists as opposed to the churches. Well, uh, you're right there. I wasn't uh, wasn't going to be relying too heavily on the churches for this, but I was wondering. If you might, if you bump into one or two of your grandchildren out there, your your American refugees that you helped out <laughs> back then, if you could point them out to the website, it's undergroundrailway.ca. If you could maybe point it out to them. I will say, post it on an e-list and mention to everyone I know. I, I appreciate that. Um, That's all I'm asking. A little bit of help from everyone, and we, we might be able to help a few people, a few Americans escape a terrible, terrible fate down south. Well, let's face it. Uh, we... Uh, aren't exactly angels up here either. No. It, uh, although we give medical exemption to people, there's no legal way for them to buy cannabis. We are still uh, arresting and charging people who run Compassion Club. That's true. I asked uh, a police officer just night before last, why are you doing this? And he says, uh, well, we're concerned that some of this pot may be going astray. Of course, what I should have said was, you know, well, <laughs> at least that pot smoker isn't going to beat up his wife and kid yeah. or cause havoc on the highway like an alcohol addict or give me uh, cancer with secondhand smoke like a nicotine addict. But, you know, these... these if it goes astray, these it'll probably responses help. occur to one too late. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to win this dignity war, and we're just coming about it now. I think uh, Steve Cubby's going to be successful. The Boje case is going to be successful. We're going to win at the Supreme Court of Canada, and we're going to turn around people's view of uh, cannabis as a helpful tool. Help. I hope so. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. We really appreciate all, all your insight and help. We're back, and uh, now we get to today. Uh, today we have a situation very much like in the past, where we have uh, a group of scapegoats who basically are, on the whole, uh, rel like tolerant of others, relatively harmless, and they are being accused of great, great crimes that are actually caused by the uh, monopolies and protect, protection rackets that are being perpetrated on them by governments. And so, again, Canada seems to be a little more progressive than the United States on this issue, like, like the slavery issue, like Vietnam, like um, the 
well, unfortunately, not like the Holocaust, uh, the Jewish Holocaust, but uh, like slavery in Vietnam, Canada seems to be more in tune with world opinion and with a more enlightened approach and the approach of the future. And it is up to us because we got the, the good news first and we got the tolerance first to do something about it. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mark Emery did a show where he said, quote, listen, don't flee the United States because they need freedom fighters there more than any other place. And I'd like to stop for a second and reiterate that. If you have the ability to fight back, if you can take a couple months in jail or whatever it's they're, they're sending you with, you can come out again, start up a marijuana party, start up a compassion club of some kind, get a, a citizen's initiative, another one on the ballots, by all means do that. Letter writing campaigns are all important. If you can possibly stay in the United States, do. But to quote Mark Emery, if you are doomed and you are already convicted and facing serious time and can no longer be active, then we will end up having a place for you to stay here while you get established. And that's what we've been doing the last couple of weeks, is getting a place together so that people, uh, if you're not dying, 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 because we are in a hospital, and you're not totally impoverished because we don't have jobs for you, but if you're, you're facing serious time you can't do or you need cannabis to survive and you can't get it, we, rather than just sit there and die in the United States, we have something here for you. Uh, what we're gonna need from you is, well, we want you to check out the website totally, uh, and uh, we'll walk you through it here. here here's an interesting quote. Uh, it's from Alliance MP Randy White uh, from the province, February 28, 2003. He says, there's no such thing as a refugee from the United States. Now, there's a fight going on to define whether there is or not, and all that evidence about the past refugees should give you the idea that the United States isn't perfect, it occasionally screws up on its policies, and Canada is kind of its safeguard. And what we're running into is opposition uh, in the Cubby case and the Beaujais case, that these might set precedents that uh, would make it easier for other people to come up. So it's still under debate right now. It's not a guarantee that you're going to escape persecution once you get up here. But I think your chances of escaping persecution up here are a lot better than surviving down in the United States. So 